Hello, party people, and welcome to Office Hours. This is a 1991 Honda Beat, and you can't really tell how small it is until I come into the frame for perspective. Yes, this is a little tiny Japanese car. It's called a K car, K-E-I, uh, for a special tax designation in Japan, uh, referring to cars that have extremely small engines, 660 cc, for those of you who are into cars. Uh, the engine in this thing is in the back in its rear wheel drive. It's a very fun car to drive. And because it's got this little tiny engine, it's got a little manual stick shift and you zip through the gears really quickly, even though it goes all the way up to 9,000 RPM. This thing feels like you're riding in like a Formula One car race, even when you're just going around the neighborhood. I have to get up to third gear before I even leave my neighborhood, which is just like 30 mile an hour streets. It is so much fun to drive. I think this is the spiritual successor to my uh, 56 Porsche Speedster replica. It has a, it's extremely small, tiny engine, but it goes like hell for reasonably small values of hell. Uh, for tons of fun. And yes, I actually fit in it, even with the top up. It's a great example of Japanese packaging uh, where it's actually comfortable for me inside here. It's kind of bananas. Um, now, the, part of the drawback with that is, is there's not even any kind of trunk in the back except for like two shoe boxes is all you can really fit in there. Tons of fun. Just picked this one up. Uh, uh, they're imported. They're now America legal. Uh, but you can tend to pick them up pretty quick, cheaply in the United States. Uh, people import them from Japan. They're like five to seven thousand dollars U.S. I got this one for seven thousand and immediately wrapped it to look like a little Japanese fighter plane from World War II. It's originally red with a white stripe, but did this uh, fake mechanical, uh, riveted aluminum-looking kind of uh, wrap to it. Had a ton of fun. So let's get to your top voted questions from PollGab. The top voted question is from Pro, who asks, are sessions sleeping during transactions harmful? And uh, if so, how come I can't prevent them server side? Yeah, well, one of the reasons that they're harmful is that they can hold open the locks that they have open. If somebody does begin TRAN, you know, does some work and then doesn't commit and just goes to sleep, uh, that can hold open its locks for a while. Um, the other thing that I worry about with this is it prevents the version store from cleaning up open transactions in any database uh, stop all database version stores from cleaning up on that same server. As to why, I believe you said, why, how can, why can't I protect, prevent them server side? Um, I, I, the why questions are really tough because I guess you just have to ask Microsoft, right? Like, why didn't they code something to fix it? I guess that's something you'd have to ask them. Um, they, what, I, I'm glad that I never went to work for Microsoft because it's a giant company, lots of bureaucracy. It's uh, hard to get things done. Fairly so. You don't want you don't want like rapid moving ninjas inside there. Uh, but I, I have no insight into why they do what they do. Next up, SQL Knitter asks, we have high page I.O. latch weights that are causing performance sluggishness. I'm trying to check index fragmentation and the query just runs and the GUI freezes. Is this potentially indicative of a highly fragmented index? No, what you're seeing is indicative of slow storage. Uh, if you check my mastering server tuning class on page I.O. latch, I teach you how to test storage using crystal disk mark and then what um, teach you the different mechanisms that you have to mitigate that slow storage. But really what you're seeing there is just slow storage. Now, can you just magically wave a wand and make your storage faster? I don't know what kind of wand you have, but I don't usually have that kind of wand at client engagements. Um, so usually what I have to do to work around that is to add memory or tune indexes or tune queries, all of which can help reduce those page I.O. latch weights. Next up, we don't do corruption check says, I don't trust my SAN admin. How can I be absolutely sure that the production snapshots he gives me are the type that I can offload CheckDB to? Well, go run CheckDB. 
go take to have them give you another server and attach the snapshots to there and go run CheckDB against it. There's a great quote. I don't know who originally said it, if it's a Russian proverb or if it was Ronald Reagan. It's really three short, simple words, trust but verify. Go verify. Go actually do the thing that he says you can do. Next up, my tea got cold says, what is your preferred query hint for telling the optimizer to predict that a lot of rows will come from a query? Oh, that's a great question. Um, for me, it's usually uh, uh, option optimize for, so you can have parameters where you say option optimize for a specific parameter value. Uh, then that way you can say optimize for a parameter that will produce really large result sets. Uh, that's the place that I would start. For lots of other options like that, uh, check out the class Mastering Parameter Sniffing, and I go into all kinds of query hints uh, inside that class. Next up, Linux asks, the SQL Server licensing docs have confounded me. Is Enterprise $7,000 per core, or is it $7,000 per year per core? Depends on how you're buying it and who you're buying it from. The sticker price for Enterprise Edition is a flat $7,000, but then there's an additional cost called software assurance that you have to pay every year in order to use new versions of uh, excuse me, of SQL Server. Plus, it gives you all kinds of other high availability and disaster recovery perks. Um, if you're renting your licensing instead of buying it outright, if you're light renting it from Amazon, Google, Microsoft, then $7,000 a year is probably an undercut. It's, it's actually higher than that uh, if you're renting uh, from those sites. Uh, next up, Bill's fan says, I receive files with hundreds of key value pairs. I want to store them as is in two columns of a table. Key value, key value. He says, my, my boss wants me to pivot those rows to columns and then merge the results into a table for easier reporting. But then new keys could arrive at any time, making merging difficult. Who's right? Okay, so first off, don't say who's right. That, there's no such thing as a right answer in technology. It's all about what's the goal that you want to optimize for. If you want to optimize for the fastest inserts, you would store them in the key value combos like you want to do. If you want to optimize for faster reporting, then you flatten that out and denormalize it like your boss wants to do. So who do you want to make happy? You or your boss? Think very, very carefully about your answer to that question. A hybrid approach that you could use is you could ingest new data in the key value formats that you like, and then once a day run a flattening query for your boss to give them nice, easy reporting tables. That way you're both unhappy. Next up, we have SQL Server guy who says, how do you see the SQL Server future? A lot of people are saying it's not worth it to learn SQL Server anymore, and instead you should go for cloud technologies to stay competitive on the job market. Um, I, for new application builds, uh, people are steering towards less uh, expensive databases. You know, it's, it's a lot like the situation with Linux and Windows. Think Linux and Windows at the uh, operating system level. Linux took the data center by storm, and most new small to mid-sized business stuff is going towards, like startups, for example, is going towards Linux. People will say, why would you ever pay for an operating system? So they do what's for free. Um, enterprises, people who need uh, specific kinds of security, single sign-on, Active Directory, all kinds of auditing stuff, they tend to go towards Windows because large enterprises, it's what they generally know and love better for a lot of that stuff. I'm generalizing most large enterprises will have both. Well, databases are going down the same road. Lots of new uh, application development is being done on MySQL and Postgres uh, and uh, databases as service kind of options, whereas enterprise application development still tends to have SQL Server and Oracle backends. It comes down to which uh, group of companies you want to work for. If you would like to work for startups and small to mid-sized businesses, you're probably going to want to use the technologies that they use. If you prefer working for larger, slower moving companies, then enterprise technology is what you would want to learn and aim for.
Next up, SQL Rage says, I have a licensed production server and I want to use one of its backups to refresh my test and QA servers in a dev server monthly. I don't have software assurance. Do I need to license either of the lower instances or would developer edition be adequate? What you want to do is go get the Microsoft licensing guide for SQL Server. It's really well written and it'll give you exactly all of Microsoft's answers for questions like this. The one part where it's just ever so slightly gray is you're saying you want to take production data and then port that into test QA and dev. Depending on how you read that doc the last time that I looked, if you used production data, the answers get a little gray area. So go through that documentation and you can decide how you'd like to read it out. Uh, next up, Consulting Madness says, my friend has a boss that references older blog posts that mention configuration items which I think SSDs and shared storage make obsolete. Do you have a current recommended configuration resource? Um, no, I, a lot of uh, documentation for things like setup hasn't been updated by folks in the last 10 or 15 years. Because hardware has been evolving so rapidly, NVMe solid state, shared, store, uh, shared storage that relies on solid state, cloud storage that's rapidly, rapidly evolving with different best practices. Best practices exist so that you can use one standard and apply it absolutely everywhere. That just doesn't really make sense in the day and age of local SSDs, shared storage, you're using SSDs, cloud storage, it's all over the place. You're not going to find any one answer that works for every situation. I've been debating about how I want to update my setup guide, and I don't really have a good answer yet for that. I don't know how I want to phrase that inside there, that there's no one golden hammer that works anymore for every server's configuration. Next up, Janice says, Hi Brent, we were wondering if you've ever restored the master database to a different server than the original. No, I did that early on in my career and it was filled with peril. I don't ever want to do that again. Janice continues, specifically, we're looking to preserve logins and their passwords during their process. That's easy. SP help rev login is one way that you can do it. Google for that SP underscore help underscore rev login. I don't know why it was ever named that way. And that'll get you access to all kinds of blog posts that do what you're describing. Different versions of that stored procedure, it's community stuff out there. Different versions of that will uh, work differently on different versions of SQL Server, so make sure you read several articles there. The other thing that you can use is DBA Tools and PowerShell. If you search for dbatools.io, it's a power PowerShell framework set of commandlets that will copy things from one server to another. Things like logins, agent jobs, etc. And then we'll do one more. Let's see. Interested app developer says, in the last episode, you mentioned a zero RPO and RTO solution uh, where queries and results were getting dumped into a schemaless database. I was quite gobsmacked. Can you give us any more reflections or details? Unfortunately, I cannot. That isn't something that I can share there. Uh, but when if you have that kind of need, just because there's only so much that I can share with what clients and with what training students do. If you have that kind of need, that's really where consulting comes in. There are some solutions where I can just say, here's how you would do it, and just, you know, I can tell you in 30 seconds and you've got enough information to go at it. Um, if you're just curious, then this it doesn't really make sense for consulting purposes. But if you have a legit business need to do that, achieve zero RPO and RTO, that's one of the reasons that that kind of thing is so bloody expensive uh, because the solutions are all hand-coded at that scale. There's nothing that you can go grab off the shelf uh, that's going to give you bulletproof results there. 
All right, that is a good round of questions. That'll be my last office hours for a while from the States. I am going to go put this thing in the garage and go start packing for Iceland. Uh, Eve and I are heading off to Iceland for a couple few weeks, uh, and I plan to do several office hours out there from out on the road, uh, different scenic areas. God only knows how the weather's going to be, of course. It's gorgeous here in uh, the Vegas. I almost took the, the sweatshirt off and did a t-shirt instead here because uh, it's a glorious 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it is not going to be that in February and March up in Iceland. Going to be a dramatically different weather experience. Uh, so hope you had fun and learned something, and I will see you all on the next Office Hours. Adios.